Oh, come here. I want to give this to you. And uh, um, let's everybody sing happy birthday today, will you say? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Davy. Happy birthday to you. You many more, and we wish you many more. May God bless and keep you. Happy birthday to you. You knew what was happening there, didn't you? Huh? Yeah. How's everybody doing tonight? Have you all had a good day? It was a little bit warm outside, wasn't it? Woo! That's good. I don't know who made spring mad, but go, go apologize to them, you know? Um, let's take some prayer requests tonight. I talked to Jackie Oxford earlier, and she's going to have a biopsy in the morning. And so we want to remember Jackie. She has a knot on her throat. Lift her up to the Lord. Um, I put on that Janet Brown passed away. That's Tammy Campbell's mom. Um, and she, her arrangements, her funeral is going to be on Saturday. Also, Becky Robinson asked that we remember her in our prayers tonight. She's down in her lower back, says she can't hardly move. So remember Becky in your prayers. Um, what other prayer requests do we have? Janet? Chris Gill, Lance Baldwin, remember that young man, also remember Wyatt Reed, we've been praying for Wyatt as well, Les, or Les in his back, and family, Lisa, Remember Lana and her family. We're leasing her back. Got all kinds of back issues going on. Melody? Remember James and his knee and also family in Mississippi. Donnie, how'd Christy do today? Okay. So remember your son and daughter, Keith Moore and Christy Hoppers. Absolutely. Lewis? Carl Miller and Dave Cook. Mar Marcel. Oh, Kevin. Had a broken leg the whole time. Wow. Remember Brother uh, Kevin? Um, he had knee replacement about a year ago, and they found out that his he's had constant pain in it, and they found out that his bone underneath the knee they replaced was broken all this time. So they're going to have to go back in there and fix it. August 10th right now. That's a long way away. Well, let's hope and pray they move that up on you. That's not funny, but it kind of is. If you want me to go take a run at it, I will. Okay. I may not be able to get it together, but I can make a mess, I'm certain. David?
Um, so Chuck Nelson, Reba Lucas, and Ernie and little Ernie Jamerson. Lois? Remember Bonnie Gilbert and Barbara Colsey. Janet? Remember Darian? Terry? Brother, Sister Sue Miracle? And also Brother Ray Gurley. Victor? Uh, Art Murray and uh, Ed Blankey on behalf of uh, Ernie. Okay. Remember Victor and Art Murray. Next Wednesday you're having surgery, Victor? Brad? Sam Pedigo family. Bob? Remember the food bank tomorrow. Tomorrow is food bank. Any volunteers can be here at 9 a.m. If you know anybody who has a need... Um, send them all out. Um, we'll have plenty of water. We need all the help we can get. We got no uh, no school kids tomorrow, so grandchildren and Haley, just our homeschool kids, yeah. But Terry. Remember Sherry Renf Renfro? I'm sorry. Rockland? Rockman, okay. All right. Had a Dave moment there. Couldn't hear. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. It's an honor and privilege to be in your house tonight. We are thankful for where you brought us from and where you're taking us. And God, tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up these requests unto you. You know each and every single situation. You know every burden, every trouble, every hardship that each and every person is facing. And God, tonight... We know your word says you're the God that healeth thee. And so, Lord, for those who are suffering physically, we pray healing upon their bodies. I pray, God, for those who are facing cancer and facing surgeries and recoveries. We pray, dear God, your special touch upon them. For those who are in the hospital, we pray, God, that you'd help them to feel better, that they may be released and get back to normal. God, we pray for the back pain that various people are having. We pray, dear God, a special touch upon that. I pray, dear Lord, that you would be with um those who are having knee surgeries and having knee troubles. And we pray, God, Lord, you're just healing hands upon them tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those who are battling grief and have recently lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would comfort them as only you can do. And we just pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd be with them. Your word says, blessed are those who mourn, um, for they shall be comforted. And you're near to the brokenhearted. And so, God, we call out to them. Lord, I pray for the lost and unsaved tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would draw them to you in a way that only you can. Your word says that if your name be lifted up, you draw all men unto thee. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw them unto you tonight. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you place people in their life who will share um, what you would have them to do. And, um, um, Lord, draw them with your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, for um, the nation tonight. I pray, Lord, as there are many ideologies that are warring against each other, there are many decisions that are being made. I pray for the United States Supreme Court as they get ready to send out this decision on 
Roe v. Wade. I pray, Lord, they would not bow down. They would not hinder. I pray that Roe v. Wade would be overturned in Jesus' name. I pray, dear God, Lord, for the um, debates that are partaking in, the, in our public arena. I pray, Lord, that truth will um, be exposed and that it will win itself. And, Lord, we just pray that it be shared. I pray, God, for the uh, conflicts that are going on overseas. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would touch them. Uh, Lord, I pray, God, you would... Um, be with the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia who are suffering. And Lord, we pray an end to that, that conflict. And we pray, dear God, a peaceful resolve. Uh, we pray that good would triumph over evil. And Lord, we just put that in your hands. Uh, Lord, we thank you for being able to come to you tonight in prayer. I pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, be with us as we look into your word tonight. May it manifest itself before us. And God, I just pray that you'd speak to us in Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. They are getting ready to build an abortion clinic in Carbondale. And there was a, a city council in Carbondale last night, a city council meeting regarding it. They have no idea where they're going to put it yet. Um, there was a few churches that went over there to stand up. Apparently, it was quite the lively debate. I got a text to, from it uh, from um, Eric Holmes, who, who work, his, a guy he works with, was his pastor was the one in Carbondale who went over there. And so we'll see what the future holds. Um, I think half the city council was for it, and half of them were against it, so we'll see what plays out. Hopefully and prayerfully, it doesn't play out the way we have an expectation for it, too. It's interesting, the debate that's going on over abortion. Um, the, um, it's even interesting, the ideas that people have, the ideologies that people have. Um, even Christians, there's a lot of Christians who I see, not necessarily here, um, but a lot of Christians on social media that are kind of wavering, you know, in spots. I don't know how you waver on life, but nonetheless, there are. Um, we're going to do trivia tonight. I just picked two cards. I did not even have time to read them. We did this one last week. I'll be right back. Talk. Yep. All right. Jacob, I'm expecting good results from you tonight, sir. What appendages did Adonai Bezek have cut from his body? What appendages did Adonai Bezek have cut from his body? This is for this whole section, not just Jacob. Toes is one of them. You're right, toes and fingers. Toes and fingers, one to nothing. How was Jude martyred according to church tradition? How was Jude martyred according to church tradition? Jude. Hey, Jude. Nope, with arrows. With arrows? Psh, psh. What period of time is represented in both Daniel and revelation by the term a time, times, and half a time. What period of time is represented in both Daniel and Revelation by the term a time, times, and half a time? A times, 
A time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years is correct. Name Gideon's father. You guys should know this one. It wasn't the answer. <laughs> Anybody? Joe Ash. How many days a year do Israel's women commemorate the daughter of Jephthah? How many days a year do Israel's women commemorate the daughter of Jephthah? How many days a year do they commemorate her? Jephthah. Jephthah. Remember she was coming... And he said the next person who walks by is dying. It was his daughter. Did you start throwing up fingers? <laughs> You're like... Anybody? Ten, is that your answer? It's four. All right, still two to nothing. Who said, we will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? Peter is correct. Where did he say that? Okay. Who wrote, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong? Who wrote, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Paul? Incorrect. Solomon. Why did Moses think he was incapable of organizing the Jews to leave Egypt? right. You didn't think he was eloquent enough. He didn't know any other words. That's right. All right, that's uh, two to two. Who was the Roman emperor when Jesus was baptized? Hmm. Herod? Nope. It's Tiberius Caesar. Which king's blood did dogs lick up as prophesied by Elijah? Which king's blood did dogs lick up as prophesied by Elijah? Ahab is correct. What was the name of Jacob and Leah's first son? What? Reuben. Reuben sandwich. How many demons did Jesus cast out of Mary Magdalene? What did you say, Martha? Jane? Seven's correct. 
Hey, don't be afraid to spit them right out. Even if it's wrong, you're fine. What request did the mother of Zebedee's sons make to Jesus? right. One on the right and one on the left. So that's what? Four to four? <laughs> uh. This is a pretty easy one. Complete the following verse. Thou shall not you got to pick the right one, though. <laughs> I'm messing with you. That's not it. That's not it. <laughs> no. Complete the following verse. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. All right. Five to four. Congratulations. If you have your Bibles, turn to Second Peter. You guys gave him a good run, West Side. You guys are getting better, I'm telling you. If you just talk one person to moving over here, I think this whole thing would change. No, that's all right. can do it on you get Bob. You tell Bob he needs to move seats. Somebody go over and shake his hand. Say, hey, sit over here. It's cooler on this side of the church. Yeah. Did you ever ask him to move? Okay. Invite, invite, invite him to sit by you. Chapter 1, 2 Peter. So, I'm finishing up my class, and a couple weeks ago I gave a project to my uh, apologetics class. They had to go out and do video interviews of a stranger, a family, and a friend. And they had to ask three questions. The first question was, do they believe in a heaven or a hell? The second question was, if the answer is yes, how do you get there? And the third question it was, if that person who they're talking to, if you'd ask them if they died today, which one would they go to and why? And so for the last three days, they've been presenting their videos, which they all did a really fairly good job, or at least 70% of them. And um, I was quite amazed by how many um, people, number one, have a works salvation. They get into heaven based on good works. Overwhelmingly, the answer of strangers... Um, their answer was, well, I've, I'm a good person. I'm, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Secondly, I noticed that there is uh, overwhelmingly, there was always, um, specifically when talking to the strangers, with the exception of, I had 10 groups, they asked three people, so 30-something interviews, with the exception of one, um, all of them used the word hopefully, hopefully I'll go to heaven. But nowhere in Scripture, I think that God gives us an assurance of our salvation. <coughs> Amen. I don't want to be laying on my deathbed and say, man, I sure hope I get to go. I want to know that I'm going. And the Bible says clearly that we can know. It says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. It tells us to live and abide in him. Um, it tells us that we have a calling to holy living, to righteous living, that we should seek after God in all ways possible. Peter's going to kind of echo this idea as he opens up this second epistle. The second epistle is only going to be three chapters long. We'll go through it relatively quick. Um, but let's begin. I've got to take that out. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. The faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God in Jesus our Lord. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are divine promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. 
Supplement your faith with a, ge- with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fall, who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you are really, that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to read one more verse. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth and you have been taught. Um, And so Peter is going to open up this first chapter, this first epistle, by reminding, number one, of God's promises and reminding them that they are to live holy and sought after lives. Um, If we were to read in the King James, the King James uses this language says, according to His divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that He hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that these might ye be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to, nor- to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you, and they make that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So, What does it mean to live a godly life? What are some examples that you guys come to mind when you, when you hear and you refer to somebody being godly? Adjectives, if you will. Forgiveness. So, do you guys say godly people should be forgiving people? Okay. What? Truth. So, godly people should be advocates for the truth. They should tell the truth. They should be truthful and honest in what they say and do. Do you say fat people? Okay. <laughs> Faithful, available, and teachable. All right, I like that. I would fit in, I guess. Kindness. Godly people should be kind people, right? Forgiving. Forgiving. What do you say, Les? Help. Full of help. Helpful. What else? What do you say, Marie? Uh? Respectful. Respectful. Yes, that's good. I like that. What else? Non-judgmental. Prayerful. Prayerful. Full of prayer. Full of prayer. Jacob, you said non. What do you mean by that? Like you don't just judge somebody based on their appearance or where they've been, recent thinking. You have respect, general, general respect for the human race. Okay, I like it. Faithful, loyal. That's good. Loving. That's good. Not holier than thou. Okay. <sighs> Amen. God's people should be a patient people. Trustworthy. Peaceful. Compassionate. Understanding. That's a good one, Jasmine. What does that mean? Empathy. I like it. Loving. What? Honorable. Honorable. Useful. Anybody else want to throw anything else out before we move on? I love good adjectives. You guys have done good. All right. So the Bible says, by his divine power, Peter quotes this, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. What is the... What does that mean, everything that we need for living a godly life? We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His glory and excellence. So Peter says that we have everything that we need to live a godly life. What do you guys think he's referring to? Number one, the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
Can I live godly without the direction of the Holy Spirit? No, He's literally God within us. A new nature. What else? The Word of God. It's the manifested Word of God we're holding in our hands. Our direction, our guidebook, if you will. Roland, were you wanting to say something? No, okay. You said the Word, okay. Preachers? Preachers? Guidepost, I agree. Wisdom, godly wisdom. So, when you come to know Christ, however your salvation tend to happen, I, my assumption is that everybody in this room has had a salvation experience. If you haven't, come and see me immediately. Like now. Okay. Um, and so, I received Jesus Christ when I was nine years old. I got up from the coffee table, and um, I didn't know everything about God. Did you? No. I've... I've uh, I'm going to baptize somebody on Sunday who recently got saved, Carl. Um, he doesn't know everything about God yet. Um, we don't know everything about God in this room, but there was, a, there, was a, there, was, there, was, there was something that within me that began to work on me, all right? Um, and so the Holy Spirit does a variety of things in our life, and I want to start there tonight. What, does the, what are things that the Holy Spirit does in our life? It guides us. So the Holy Spirit is literally a director in our lives. It, it, it's a teacher. The Holy Spirit is a teacher in our life. It's a convictor. How many of you have ever been convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit? You've, you've been somewhere or said something or done something or in a situation that you know you shouldn't be in and God's Spirit convicts you of it. Amen? Comforts us. Um, when you've been moved beyond despair and you don't have any idea what the truth brings or what tomorrow is going to bring, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a simple comfort in your life. And that comfort is the love and respect of the Holy Spirit, right? What did you say, Dave? Praise. Praise for us. Romans 8. Roland just got done covering this in Romans 8. By the way, if you guys don't come to Roland's class on Sunday night, I'm telling you, he's a wonderful Bible teacher. Come check him out at 5 o'clock. Um, Romans 8, the Bible says, when you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf with utterings and groanings that we can't even understand. What else? Guides, guides, directs. Now, when I, assurance, that's a good one. When I got up that day, I didn't realize the Holy Spirit did all that in my life. Amen? In fact, that was almost 30 years ago, and I just started figuring out a few years ago <laughs> what actually the Holy Spirit does in my life. Most Christians ignore the power and leadership and direction and guidance of the most powerful being on the face of this planet, the Spirit of God which lives within you. Amen? And so one of the things that we have to endure to, to be able to take on these promises is, number one, we have to realize that we have God literally within us, the power of the Holy Spirit. Understanding that He does all those things. When you don't understand, He teaches you. Um, when you need guidance, He guides you. When you need admonition or um, um, you, you need scolding, He scolds. He scolds you. When you need, uh, you don't know how to pray, He prays on your behalf. Um, when you need convicted, He convicts you. Um, when you need comfort, He comforts you. And so Peter implying, we see by His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. In fact. Uh, Roland pointed out a few weeks ago as Jesus is leaving and He's ascending into heaven, He said, it is good that I leave so that He may come. In fact, really at this point, the Bible says that Jesus is advocating us at the right hand of the Father, but who's constantly at work in our life? He, the Holy Spirit, He's here, He's present. He's the third part of the Godhead, the Trinity, moving in our lives, orchestrating events that sometimes we see and we don't see. We recognize and we don't recognize. Um, and so there He is. And it said, Peter says, we have received all of this by coming to know Him. How do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit? By coming to know Him, right? By coming to know Him. By coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. What are those great and precious promises? Everlasting life. What else? 
Never leave us nor forsake us. I'll tell you what, real quick, flip back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice in chapter, in the second epistle, the second letter, he's referring to these precious promises. Let's just read chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. All praise be to God. This is 1 Peter 1. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, we now live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though while you have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire test and purifies gold. Through your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So you, when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love Him even though you have never seen Him. Though you do not see Him, you trust Him and you... Rejoice with the glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting Him will be salvation of your souls. Do you see some promises in there? So Peter kind of opens up similar to his first epistle. Hey, listen, there's, there's promises that are waiting on us. And by receiving Him, we're called to live godly lives. And then he says, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And then we see this. Supplement your faith with a generous provision. King James uses... Um, and besides this, giving all diligence and add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. This glory, this promise that He promised of the Holy Spirit coming in our lives. The promise that He has of eternal life. The promise of great joy that lays ahead. And it says these things. It says, supplement or fill in your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Mm. What does moral excellence mean? You just said what I said. You uh, literally twice now. You've said exactly what I've said. What does that mean? What is moral excellence? Sinless. Very honest banker who never did anything wrong. Never does anybody wrong. What a very good car salesman, was he? He was morally excellent. Bob? Choosing God's way. Choosing God's way. That's good. <laughs> Dave? Counting every stroke on the golf course. <laughs> when you're by yourself. It's the only way you're going to get better. <laughs> Brad? So, we see the word moral. So, the very idea of moral is, is, is living rightly, living with um, godliness, living with holiness, living right. Um, we get our morality from where? From the Bible, but ultimately from God. Before there was actually a giving of the law, um, which came in Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai, before that time, did they know what was right and what was wrong? Before Noah built the ark, did they know what was right and what was wrong? Before um, Cain killed Abel, did Cain was it written down anywhere that you shouldn't kill? So how was Cain to know that it was wrong to kill his brother? Because there's a morality that's written on us, isn't there? It's written on our hearts. 
Um, I'm, I'm very thankful for the law of God. But even without the law of God, there's morality in our lives. Because God, He made us in His image and He wrote it on our hearts. Um, people who don't believe in the Bible, do they still, do we still see moral, mor- morality in their lives? Yeah, we do, right? There's a lot of believers and we don't see them just come up and kill people or take, right? They, they have this idea of morality that's written upon us. There's a natural difference in somebody's heart when they know the difference between right and wrong. But it doesn't just call for morality here, for moral, it calls for moral excellence. So excellence being the height of it. So not only do we have it written on his heart, but we also have the law of God in our hands. We have a right, a guidebook that directs us in the right way to live, the right way to treat people, the right way to handle money, the right way to talk to people, the right way to communicate, the right way to respond to our government, the right way to submit, the right way to respect, the right way to do things. And so when God gives us all that he's given us, should he demand moral excellence from us? Amen? Yeah. So, last night, um, I decided um, to install a, some sinks in my bathroom. Dave helped me um, remodel our bathroom a few years ago. Um, and I, I, I like to be cheap. And so, me and Stephanie, I said, Stephanie, let me take care of getting everything. And I ordered these faucets off Amazon. Bad idea. I paid $40 for two of them. In two years, they rusted all the way out. And then I got these sinks. And these sinks, every time you put water in, they were so thin and so they just splash out on you. Well, yesterday morning I woke up. Um, it's funny because when I preach about certain things, that ends up happening to me. Remember on, on like uh, Job on, on, on the Sunday and I, one message, one thing after another thing. I woke up yesterday morning and the water had gone out. Um, yesterday we, we helped move Larry and Francis Clayton and I hate moving, but nonetheless we did it. I got home and I had to, not the water had gone out, but the, those, those faucets had rotted out. I got home, I got those, I had to work, I worked for like four and a half hours putting these faucets in because a normal person could do it, but listen, in, in a lot less time, but I'm Andy and I have some, I'm not the jack of all trades yet, but I'm working on getting there. And so, man, I start working on this and I get done with the, I get done with the faucets and the air conditioner went out. It was like, boom, boom, boom. And I looked at, I thought, Lord, I get it. Amen. You're still good, right? Um, and so, Anyway, I'm putting these faucets in, and, and, and the first thing you got to do in order to fix the faucet and take the sink is you got to take the old ones out. But if you got rust on something over a period of time, it's awful. And so I'm, Ugh. so finally I just think to myself, I can't get the screw undone, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to reuse these faucets. So I just break them off. That was a bad idea. Because then you leave this little piece in there. All right. So finally, I I called in my father. I was like, "Hey, Dad, praise God for dads, Amen." And he's like, "We'll take a hammer and beat it out." And so I did. And nonetheless, and so I'm putting it all back together, and I I'm putting this on, and I, I get I get to the to the faucets, and and I, I realize there's two drains, and I've stared at this for a long time, and I'm thinking, I mean, I'm not a dummy, I'm really not, but I'm sitting there thinking to myself, there's not. There's only one hole. Why do I need two drains? And I'm thinking, gosh, this just looks weird. And uh, Stephanie finally walks by and she says, hey, do you want the directions? I was like, I do. Now, I think if I'd have sat there long enough, I might have figured out that they gave me two different size drains for whatever size hole I had. But once I looked at the directions and actually read it, I was able to do it a lot quicker. I think there's a moral law that's written on the heart of man. But when you realize what God's done with the power of the Holy Spirit, and when you take His Word, and you start directly applying it to the applications of your everyday life, it'll help you get there a lot quicker. Does that make sense? And a lot of Christians, a lot of God's followers, they're blindly trying to get through life and try to seek out moral excellence and godliness with their book closed the whole time with their prayer life shut down, not surrounding themselves by Christian believers who edify and build them up. And you're going to have a hard time growing if you don't have those things in your life. And what happens is we don't reach moral excellence. Instead, we live way down here 
and we justify living down here when simply when we begin to open up the book and breathe in what God has for us and allow the Holy Spirit to manifest it in our lives and when we can when we covet time with prayer when prayer is an accident or an incident or 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 a, a stronghold or a, something that we just got to do when it becomes something that we long for in a time that's special to us what we begin to see is growth and development in our lives And so many Christians, we are all called to moral excellence. We live down here because we've got the directions closed beside us. And so Peter says, listen, he said, in this world, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. Knowledge going right into the Word. How do we learn more about God? The Word? Amen. The Word, we start with the Word. Listen, you want to know about God? Read His book. There's 66 books. I I promise you, every time you go to it, there's something new that you're going to learn. It's the living Word. There's something new that applies. I've read the same stories over and over and over again countless times. And every time when I read them, I see something brand new. Why? Because it's a living Word. It moves in my life. Different things challenge me. Different things convict me. Um, Listen, I I want to study study this Word. I remember, how many of you have ever seen that movie, Fireproof? Um, there's this line when Kirk Cameron's talking to his co-worker, and the co-worker's talking about his wife. And um, he says, you've got to study your wife. And he said, well, Kirk Cameron says, well, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, what, what, how, how well do you know your wife? And he says, well, I know her pretty well. He says, how well do you know your wife? He says, I'm working on my doctorate. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, I got my high school diploma. He said, I got my associate's degree, I got my bachelor's degree, and he said, I got my master's degree, and he said, now I'm working on my doctorate. He says, I study my wife. Why? Because I want to have a better relationship with her. We need to take that aspect and bring it to God. You need to study God. Learn more about Him. Um, with Stephanie, we've been married 20 years, and some of you in this room have been married a lot longer. You learn more about your spouse every day, amen? Why? Because you spend time and you communicate. You know their likes, their dislikes. Um, Bob, Martha, you probably know what each other's thinking right now. You probably know what each other's going to say. Uh, Roland, you and, you and Vicky probably know that. Well, Vicky may not, but anyway, because <laughs> Roland's surprising sometimes. Anyway, um, Larry, Joyce, Richie, Lisa, you can imagine, right? Because you know each other and you've, you've been intimate and you've, you've spent this time together and you, you know each other very well. It's the same aspect with God. When we start studying God, not just in His Word, but experiencing Him in our daily lives, remembering what battles that He's brought us through, the prayers that He's answered, the hardships that He's helped us face, how He's always been present. He's never forsaken us. He's never left us. And so the Bible says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promise. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. Knowledge with self-control. What does self-control mean? Jacob? Not, not say that again. You said it. I just couldn't. Not doing something without thinking about it first. Okay. Not doing something without thinking about it first. Okay. How many of you in this room have self-control? Everybody's got it. There's a difference between having it and exercising it, right? <laughs> Amen? I think we all have it, but just sometimes we don't exercise it. What are some of the biggest things that we fail to control? Temper. temper. How many of you have ever lost control of your temper? How many of you have lost control of your temper today? <laughs> Keith went like this. <laughs> um, that's a big one. How about your, your tongue? You ever lost control of your, your tongue? You ever lost control of your lust? Amen? Our time. We have a lot of things under our control, don't we? And if we were to live morally excellent or we had to live with knowledge to know what we know, then all of this stair steps into taking what you've learned, what you've acquired, what you've experienced, and start applying it to your lives. How do I do that? By practicing self-control. The more I read, the more I know when a situation comes up. I know what events make me angry. I know when the vein's going to stick out in the top of my head, as the boys point out every time I get mad. Um, I know what's going to raise my blood pressure. I know what's going to 
put me in a situation that could tempt me to lose control. And so when you start navigating these areas in your life and Peter's addressing these folks and he's saying, listen, Christians should have self-control. We should. We shouldn't fly off the handle. We should have self-control in every aspect. We should have self-control when we're on social media. Do you know how quick it is to lose your witness when you lose your self-control? Amen? Uh, have you ever had somebody that you think a lot of and all of a sudden they lost self-control and it changed them in your light? It's a big deal, isn't it? Um, when you have somebody who impacts your life and all of a sudden, man, they lose their self-control. Um, I think of me, I'm your pastor. If you saw me screaming and cussing in the middle of traffic, would you say, well, I'm sure proud he's my pastor. You would say, that's a horrible job as a leader, right? If you've seen me lusting after some um, woman or, or, or cheating him on my wife because I've lost self-control of my lust, would you, that's my pastor. You wouldn't like that, right? Why, it would kill my witness instantaneously, wouldn't it? In our lives, we have people that are watching us and our self-control matters. Not only does your self-control matter to your witnesses, but it's some, it matters to most of your strongest witnesses. You think of the children we're raising up. Do they ever witness losing our self-control? Amen? Our spouses, those closest to us, our co-workers, our self-control can have an impact on their life. Exercise self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. Self-control ultimately leads to what? Patience, right? Amen? When you start controlling things, it starts leading patient. Um, have you ever had somebody say something to you and you just wanted to blow up? Like, have you ever left a conversation and you're thinking about that conversation on your way home and you're like, man, I should have said that. Or got home and you're laying in bed and you're like, man, I could have came back with this and I could have really got them. Like you replayed it over in your head. And then all of a sudden you just realize, thank God that you gave me self-control. But when your self-control ultimately produces patience in your life, you become more patient with people. You ultimately become more patient with God, which is a weird statement, but sometimes God directs us to wait and to be patient. Um, Job, he had to learn what? Patience. Through his trial, he learned patience. It helps us deal with situations and circumstances. Be patient. Um, Dave, for years when we worked on projects, Dave has said, Andy likes to be there at the beginning and he likes to be there at the end. He hates the middle part. And he's always preaching to me about, i got to learn what? Patience. you got to learn patience. If you're going to have something good, it comes in patience. Um, in life, the self-control leads to patience. Patient endurance. And patient endurance will ultimately lead to godliness. And so we see this stacking, this stepping, this moral excellence, knowledge, knowledge to self-control, self-control to patient endurance. And what does it equal? Godliness. What does God call us to be like? Him. We are to have God-like qualities in our lives. And godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, Peter says, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, we see this description. God wants us to grow this way. And if we don't do this, then it appears that we're short-sighted and we are impatient and we're blind, all right? Short-sighted, impatient, and blind. Forgetting that we have been cleansed from, their, from our old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you are really among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. So Peter emphasizes there that there may be danger of what? Falling away. Falling away from what? God, uh, it would be a non-Calvinistic verse. <laughs> it would not be uh, um, an eternal security verse, but it would imply that there's a possibility that you could what? Fall away. Um, how many people have you seen that have walked away from God? Do you know somebody who's walked away from God? They've walked away from the house of God. They've walked away from godly living. And more often than not, I will say typically, because I'm sure there's a few exceptions, 
More often than not, if you look at their life, they didn't grow in moral excellence. They didn't grow in knowledge of God. They didn't grow in um, self-control. They didn't grow in allowing God to lead their spirit. And eventually, it pushed them away. Amen? Why? Because we don't just come to Christ, we come to Christ and there's more for us. There's a growing that takes place in us. And so he warns them, he says that God will give you, he said, God, God has called you and chosen you. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then will God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, when I was looking at these projects the last three days, um, after the first one, I started noticing, I could immediately tell by the first question, by the way that somebody answered the first question, where they would go, whether they would be for God or against God. Because when they asked that first question, do you believe in he heaven or hell? There was almost an excitement to the Christian. Yeah, I believe in it. How do you get there? And they knew the right answers. They knew the right words. They knew the right things. They didn't circle the wagon and say, well, I've been a good person. I, I don't really believe in that. Or, or They didn't walk away and say I'm uncomfortable. But they were able to share their answers eloquently and quickly. And I will tell you that as men and women of God, God doesn't want mediocrity from us. He wants us to grow in the likeness of Him. And Peter's urging these people who are scattered abroad in a world where they are being persecuted, where they are being mistreated, where every where their ideologies of the world do not agree with them. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound like the world we're living in today? He tells them to be godly, to be like Him. We should be so set apart. In his first book, he calls us uh, royal priesthoods, spiritual houses. Peter goes out of his way to call people to live godly, holy lives. He quotes Isaiah in 1 Peter, Be ye holy as I am holy. What we see is God, Peter throughout these epistles calling Christians who are going through some horrible things, who are dying for their faith, to live stronger, more godly lives. When people look at you, do they see God in your life? Do they see the virtues of God in your life? Do your neighbors know you're a Christian? Do your co-workers know that you're in love with Jesus Christ? What about your family? Does your family know that you're in, G in love with Jesus Christ? And so I encourage and challenge each of us tonight in all these areas. Let's grow in our faith. Let's seek out God. Let's study God. Let's spend time with God. Let's experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's look for Him daily to watch, it, watch ourselves grow. Let's get further from where we used to be to where God wants us to be. Peter says, if you do this, look how he finishes this verse up, then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, I always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth that you have been taught. Amen? Any questions, comments? All right, good opening chapter. Right, Heather? So this week, live godly. Amen? All right. Don't forget about food bank in the morning. 9 a.m. We'd love to have you. It's going to be a hot one. Praise the Lord. Not, I guess heat's better than being cold. All right. You're dismissed. <laughs>